Hello and welcome to Chapter 11, Physical Development in Middle Childhood. In middle childhood, there's a lot of development going on. We're talking about the elementary school years from about age 7 to 12. Uh, and we'll talk about what influences children's growth, the nutritional needs they have, what kinds of health threats children have, what's going on with motor development, fine motor, mo gross motor development, uh, what kind of special needs might arise, and then talk a little bit about mainstreaming and inclusion with children with special needs. During middle childhood, kids grow about two to three inches a year, and at age 11 is the one time in life where the average girl is taller than the average boy. That sounds like a good quiz question or a final exam question. So at age 11, your average girl is four foot 10 and your average boy is four foot nine and a half inches. So I always picture those middle school dances um, where the boys have their hands reaching up uh, to the girls' shoulders. You always see those in the middle school type uh, TV shows and movies. It's also very common to see differences of a good half of a foot with children the same age uh, because depending on when kids hit puberty will depend on their size. So middle school is one of those times I think you walk around the hallways and you'll see a big discrepancy. You'll see really short kids, really tall kids, and it, it's very common at that age more so than at other times in life. Uh, height and growth is genetically determined but a lot of societal influences also affect children how affluent they are their dietary habits nutrition and then disease those things can also affect growth and development nutrition is a big issue more so than people realize sometimes kids are malnourished in a way where they may get enough calories and enough food but they're, what they're eating isn't really giving them the nutrients they need for their brains uh, nutrition has a very strong link to cognitive development and it, Good nutrition also relates to teeth and bones, health that way. Um, and we know that when it comes to standardized test scores, emotional health, um, anxiety, activity level, all of these things relate back to nutrition. Obviously, there's other issues that affect these things as well, but nutrition definitely has an impact. This chart is in your book on page 277, and it just looks at boys and girls and it looks at receiving low nutrient levels and high nutrient levels and it just shows that as you can see across the board that the higher nutrient level that children receive the better they do in different areas for energy level for self-confidence and of course there's other other areas it affects as well in general the majority of children that live in this part of the world get the nutrients they need to reach their full potential but in other parts of the world inadequate nutrition and disease as this says um, can take its toll and it can actually affect how tall someone grows to be and there tends to be some uh, distinction between certain racial and ethnic groups and how that affects their development the issue of human growth hormones um, I'm sure you've heard about it in the news in relationship to uh, professional athletes but it's also an issue with children who are small and the parents are worried that their children aren't going to reach their full growth potential so uh, this does it does happen where children are given artificial growth hormones to increase their height and it's kind of a controversial issue but it is done childhood obesity Obesity is defined as body weight that's more than 20% above average for a person's given height and weight. One in eight children in the United States is ob considered obese. And this proportion has tripled since the 1960s. So it is definitely becoming an epidemic. It can be a combination of uh, genetic and social characteristics. It could be parenting. Very commonly can be parenting. It's very easy to appease a child by giving them food. I can speak from that from experience. Um, you know, when sometimes it's easier to keep a kid quiet by giving him food. But uh, when you think about the long-term results of that, um, that can last a lifetime. Um, our sedentary lifestyles, the way we live now, is very uh, not, we're not in motion the way we used to be. Kids used to walk to school more, they'd walk to the store, they would do a lot of outdoor activities. Kids spend a lot more time, as do adults, in front of screens, uh, getting a ride to school even when school's really close by, even sitting and having snacks when they're watching TV. And when you watch TV and eat, it's almost like your brain doesn't really realize how much food you're, go you're eating. Do you ever feel like you open a bag of chips, you have one chip, and then you're all of a sudden you're at the bottom of the bag? How did I get there? Uh, so mindless eating can help, help or can contribute to childhood obesity as well. 
when dealing with childhood obesity, there's one goal of treatment that's really important. The goal is not weight loss, but that the child will continue to grow in height, but not gain weight. So the goal would be to maintain weight as they grow in height, not to lose weight, because children need fat for brain development, and it's really important, unless we're talking severe obesity, uh, children in general, they should be when you're dealing with an obesity issue, they should be growing taller and maintaining the weight. Hopefully that makes sense. We know uh, fast food is incredibly high in fat and calories and also in sodium. Uh, controlling how much junk food is in the house, that's a big one. I think a lot of households, the children have free reign and free access to how candy or snacks. Some kids can control that and they know when they're full. Um, other kids cannot. The other issue is um, the clean plate club theory. Uh, I remember, you know, you, uh, I've heard my kids be praised by adults who, oh, you're such a good eater. And I always think eating's not a skill. It's not like, you know, oh, you won a basketball game. Oh, you cleared your plate. Um, I think in our society, we still tend to praise kids as if it's a skill to eat large quantities of food. Uh, so I often try to joke with that with my kids when people tell them they're good eaters. I'm thinking that's not something to, to strive for is being a good eater. The media uh, can, in many people's opinion, including mine, have a major impact on our self-image for boys uh, to be big and strong and masculine or whatever society's views of masculine are and that that's how you're successful. And for girls, it's to be small and petite uh, and beautiful and that that's how you'd become popular. Um, so there's a lot of questions about what can parents and teachers do to help kids deal with the issues that come into play for that. So you had a, uh, some videos to watch related to that topic as well, and hopefully you had some good comments. Many of you had a lot of great comments on that. Um, it's interesting, girls tend to view themselves as being heavier than they are, um, it, than the, what their ideal image is, but boys tend to see themselves as bigger and more muscular than they actually are. So girls tend to have a lower self-esteem on these things. This chart's in your book, it's on page 279, and it looks at BMIs from 1963 to 2003-2004, uh, and it shows the different age ranges from 2 to 5, 6 to 11, 12 to 19, and it really kind of skyrockets um, in the percentage of kids um, and what the ki average kids' BMIs are. Um, so it's kind of a scary trend. So what can you do to deal with kids with weight issues? Well, the, to tell your kid, oh, you need to go exercise is not going to usually encourage kids. Kids don't like to be told they're fat. They don't like to be told to exercise. So they say if you make exercise fun, if you're an exercise role model, um, and doing activities together, taking walks and bike rides after dinner, uh, gear activities to your child's particular physical level and what their motor skills are. Encourage them to find a friend, someone they can do it with. Um, encourage them in, to participate in sports, but don't be put too pushy. And one important one is also to not use physical activity as a punishment. So physical health during middle childhood. Most kids, 90%, get some kind of what they consider a serious medical condition during the six-year period of middle childhood. Some get migraines, uh, there's colds and respiratory infections, all different kinds of uh, typical illnesses that children get, so that's pretty common and most of the time they're not too serious. Uh, but some illnesses can actually are actually becoming more prevalent in today's society. Asthma. As you're listening to this video, I'd be curious if I asked around the class how many people have asthma or have someone in their family who has asthma. More than 7% of children, that's people under the age of 18, have asthma. That's 7% of kids. That's a lot. Uh, it's, it has periodic wheezing, it's coughing, it's shortness of breath, um, and various factors can trigger asthma from respiratory infections to airborne irritants, uh, to stress, to exercise-induced asthma. We know there's been an increase in air pollution. We know there's more accurate diagnoses. Um, there's more exposures to triggers, it's like dust. And we also know poverty has an impact on asthma as well. This chart just looks at the prevalence of asthma from 1980 to 96, and then from 96 to 2009. Um, and so it's just an interesting increase. Psychological disorders. There's been an increase in psychological disorders with children over the past few years. Bipolar uh, is one that has been on the rise. Um, 
it's often been that people neglect the symptoms of psychological issues with kids and they just assume, oh, that's kids. But I think there's, in some ways, I think there's underdiagnosis and in some ways I think there's overdiagnosis, depending. Uh, but they say one in five children and adolescents has a psychological disorder that produces some kind of impairment. So that's 20% of the ch children and adolescent population suffers from some kind of psychological issue. The experts say that about 5% of preteens suffer from depression. They can be treated with medication, uh, but it does manifest differently in children and adults, and the way they respond to medication is different also. There are a variety of approaches used to deal with uh, childhood psychological disorders, but they have found that medication usually is the most effective. Uh, they've done a lot of research with behavioral therapies and things like that, but what they usually do find um, is that the medication does tend to work the best. Gross motor skills improve significantly in middle childhood. Uh, it's a lot to do with the coordination. So they're getting, hopefully, they're learning to ride bikes and swim and skate, jump rope, skills they couldn't perform as well previously. So this chart just looks at from a six-year-old to a 12-year-old, some of the milestones like throwing a ball, um, walking on a balance beam, hopping, uh, that kind of, you might take a minute and pause it to look at the rest of this chart. The myelination in the brain, that's that fatty substance, uh, that coats the neurons, that helps with increased attention. So, it, But it also helps with increase in fine motor. So things like holding a pen, holding a pencil, drawing, tying their shoes, buttoning buttons. Um, and so there, it increases dexterity. So they're starting to get the dexterity that be pretty close to what they're going to have as an adult. As you probably remember from your own schooling experiences, the kids who are better with sports and physical, competen physical competence tend to do better socially as well. Uh, but it's important that kids understand sports are supposed to be fun. They're supposed to help maintain physical fitness. It's supposed to, the participation in sports should also teach social skills, get them comfortable with their body. Um, so it's just important that there's not an overemphasis on the physical ability. These are just thinking about the goals in participating in sports. As kids get into this age group, uh, school age group, they have a lot more independence, which means there's a lot more safety issues. Boys are more likely to be physically injured than girls, possibly because in general they tend to be more physically active. Cyberspace uh, is a in dangerous place for kids. Yes, there's great things to be learned, but it's also scary and kids and even teenagers and even college students often don't realize uh, the, some of the threats that are out there. I've often had my kids accidentally come across inappropriate things on the computers. It's important that parents pay attention to the settings on their computers, also that they're paying attention to what their kids are looking at, not letting kids meet strangers um, on the computer, and that parents are supervising all computer use. This also holds true for cell phones uh, that are ha smartphones and realizing that kids ha can have the internet in their pocket uh, and can be secretive with it. I know plenty of teenagers who set up Facebook pages behind their parents' backs and things like that. This chart is in your book and it just gives you a list of threats. This is on page 286, online safety rules, so you might pause and take time to read it. Children with special needs. So there's some important concepts that are talked about in this chapter related to special needs. Some of them are obvious, visual and auditory impairment, um, speech impairments, stuttering, learning disabilities. Um, one of the th keys with stuttering, and this is actually in the early childhood MTEL, is that the biggest issue with stuttering is that it hurts a child's self-esteem. To ADHD, you've heard lots about, uh, whether it's overdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, or both, depending on the situation. These are three terms that you'll hear a lot about in education. Least restrictive environment. This means that their, every child's educational setting should be as similar as possible to a child who does not have special needs. And this is unique and different for every child, but whether it be that you know they're in the main regular ed classroom, like the typical child for most of the day, except for speech or um, except for math or except for reading, or if there's full inclusion, uh, where all services are met inside the cl same classroom, where instead of pull-out services, the services come into the classroom. Uh, but least in restrictive environment is an important one because it is that it's as much as possible like the typical child. Mainstreaming is where the child is integrated to the fullest extent possible into the traditional classroom, but there's maybe pull-out for certain situations. And remind me, we can talk more about that in class. So these are some of the looking back questions at the end of the chapter that you should probably want to be able to answer after you've read it.